we have not seen them green. We've seen in the photographs that they're sort of irregular gray color. But we can understand how it is that uh, the dark areas may have been reported green. And we've, the dark areas may have been reported green. And we've prepared a little experiment. And let me describe what this experiment is about. First of all, the argument went like this. Lowell said, my goodness, the dark areas of Mars are green. What do I know on Earth that's green? Well, plants are green, so there are plants on Mars. That was the argument. You can see that's not a, a very good argument. It's about as good as the one for dinosaurs on Venus. But the question is, are the dark areas of Mars green? So what we've done here, we'll need the lights down a little bit, is to reconstruct a, obviously this doesn't look extremely much like Mars, but it's an irregular pattern, a dark area and a bright area next to each other. And I ask you to just check whether, in your view, I'll make a poll in a moment, whether in your view the right-hand part of this looks green. It certainly does to me. Uh, the left-hand part is a kind of pink. Now, what actually is happening here? What's happening is that we have a red irregular feature and a white disk. The white disk is surely white. But when we make the red pattern close to the white, the eye attributes to the neutral white region the complementary color. And the complementary color to red and orange is blue and green. So this is a kind of optical illusion, another failure of the human eye. Can I just take a brief poll? Uh, I won't be angry if nobody saw green, but uh, will those who did see green please raise your hands? Virtually everybody. Thank you. So here again, a kind of problem with the human eye. Finally, Lowell saw changes on Mars. And here he was not mistaken. There is no doubt that there were changes. And we can see some of these changes. Here are three views of the same area of Mars, the Solus Locus area of Mars. And let's first do a close-up of the left-hand region. Good. Now, we see a large polar cap, which uh, means it is winter, right? In winter, the polar cap is large on Mars. In spring, it is small. We see a only moderate contrast between the bright and dark markings. Here is uh, the Solus Locus region. Now, if we can dissolve into the next image, lovely. This is the same region, but now in spring. We see with a small polar cap. And now the contrast between bright and dark features is much greater. Lowell argued that what is happening here is that as the polar cap melts, the waters are carried down to the vegetation near the equator, and the vegetation grows, darkens the ground, and that's what's happening. These seasonal changes surely happen. We have them on photographs. Maybe they're due to vegetation. Maybe they're due to something else. That is a topic we'll cover in the next lecture. But let us now dissolve to the third view here. And here we see a vast, irregular, bright patch, which has simply covered over the uh, dark markings underneath. At the same season of the year, we see the small polar cap. Lowell correctly understood this to be a great dust storm, in which dust was carried by the Martian atmosphere over and obscuring the dark material. And those dust storms are important, and we will refer to them many times again. Now. I would like now to turn to the second um, great discovery of the year 1877. This one, a real discovery, the moons of Mars. Now, the moons of Mars had been an idea that, were, that was around for a long time. In fact, we can find it in the most unlikely places, in a uh, story called Micromegas by Voltaire. 
and in the famous book by Jonathan Swift called Gulliver's Travels. It's an interesting place to find the moons of Mars, especially before they were discovered, but here it is. Volume 2, 1766, printed for C. Bathurst in Fleet Street. And uh, this is something that happens to Gulliver when he goes to the floating aerial island of Laputa. This is not Lilliput, and it is not Brobdingnag, but Laputa. And it is probably good not to know Spanish to think of Laputa. The comment which Swift makes is the following. He says, they have extended their discoveries much farther than our astronomers, astronomers in Europe. They have likewise discovered two lesser stars, or satellites, which revolve about Mars, and then describes the distances of the moons from Mars and how long they take to go around the planet. And uh, these turn out to agree with a uh, relation first announced by Johannes Kepler, and he says, uh, that this evidently shows them to be governed by the same law of gravitation that influences the other heavenly bodies. Now, how could Jonathan Swift have known about the moons of Mars? He, he didn't get the distances and the, the length of the month exactly right, but even there he came pretty close. How could he have gotten the existence of the moons of Mars correctly? How could he know? There are many proposals on this, including one that he was a Martian, um, but there is excellent evidence that Jonathan Swift was not a Martian. He was very much a terrestrial. Well, we have to go even earlier in history in order to answer that question. Unlike the novelists and writers of romantic fiction of today, people in Jonathan Swift's time knew something about science. And uh, in particular, there was the idea which had been first formulated by Johannes Kepler in the 16th century, that Mars had two moons. Kepler's argument was tremendously simple and naive, and it went like this. He will use our orrery again. Uh, Kepler said, look, here is the Earth. It has one moon. Here is Jupiter. It has four moons, the four big moons that Galileo had discovered. That's all I knew then. Here's Mars in an intermediate position. Well, if it's in an intermediate position, it probably will have an intermediate number of moons, said Kepler. Why not? So what number is between one and four? Well, that was well known in the 16th century. Uh, two or three. But uh, Kepler liked two because he liked geometrical progressions. He was a fan of geometrical progressions, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. He loved such things. Um, and so he said, Mars has two moons. Now, it's a silly argument. And what's more, Jupiter doesn't have four moons. It has 12 or 14 or 20 or something like that. They're being discovered every month. Um, and, and the argument breaks down even if it were a good argument. But Kepler was a famous astronomer, and for very good reasons. He was very clever. But he made mistakes, like everyone does. This was one of his mistakes. But what happened was, people remembered the conclusion and forgot how silly the argument was. Said, ah, Kepler says there are two moons. So people believed there were two moons, although no one had found them. Then in the year 1877, a new telescope was completed outside of Washington, D.C. at the United States Naval Observatory. And the astronomer Asaph Hall decided it would be a nice thing to go out and discover the two moons that everyone knew existed, but unfortunately no one had yet seen. And uh, so he went out and looked, couldn't see anything, looked again, couldn't see anything, came home discouraged and told his wife that uh, this was foolhardy and he was giving up the search for the moons of Mars. His wife told him that she would hear no such thing, and he was to go right back to that telescope and find those moons of Mars. And he dutifully marched off to the telescope, and that very night found the first of the two moons of Mars. He called the two moons Phobos 
and Demos.